everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight. Uh, I am going to get us started here. Hi again, everyone. My name is Erica. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the events associate here at Books Are Magic. Um, before we get, oh, thank you. Um, before we get into tonight's conversation, I did just want to go over a few housekeeping points for tonight. Um, first off, we are kindly asking folks to keep their mask on at all times during this event, covering both your mouth and your nose. Um, towards the end of the conversation, we will be doing an audience hand raise Q&A, so please start thinking of some questions to ask now. Raise your hand when the time comes. Um, after the talk tonight, Nona will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door, where you will also be able to exit after tonight's event. We do also have additional books available to purchase from my, purchase from my colleagues, both named Anna, whom you met at check-in. Um, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we encourage you to buy a copy of Bad Sex online using the link in the live stream description. Tonight, it is my privilege to introduce Nona willis Aronowitz and Samita Mokopadier, oh, I'm so sorry, Samita, <laughs> who are here to discuss Nona's newest collection of essays, Bad Sex. Having read Nona's work surfaced my own Catholic guilt surrounding sex and sexual liberation, leaving me with new thoughts and ideologies to process. Nona writes Bad Sex not only as a study of ambivalent wives and unchill sluts, free lovers and radical lesbians, sensitive men and woke misogynists, but also as an extension of herself, an invitation that inspects the possibilities of sexual awakenings, a chronicling of Nona's experiences, an archive of social dynamics and historic movements. Nona willis Aronowitz is the sex and love columnist for Teen Vogue. Her reporting and essays have been published in the New York Times, The Cut, Elle, among many others. She's the co-author of Girl Drag, Crisscrossing America, Redefining Feminism, and the editor of two award-winning anthologies of her mother Ellen Willis's work, Out of the Vinyl Deeps and The Essential Ellen Willis. Samina Mokopadie is a writer, editor, and speaker. She is the co-editor of Nasty Women, Feminism, Resistance, and Revolution in Trump's America, the author of Outdated, Why Dating is Ruining Your Love Life, which we are selling tonight, and author of the forthcoming book, The Myth of Making It. Her work has appeared in New York Magazine, The Atlantic, Vanity Fair, among many others. So without further delay, everyone please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nona and Samita. <laughs> Before we get into the q and I'm um, going to read a little something. The context of this chapter is responding to the idea of heteropessimism. You may or may not have heard that term. It's basically about, it basically means um, when heterosexual people, usually women, um, feel very dejected about their own um, orientation and say stuff like men are trash, ha ha ha. Um, and don't really interrogate why they are heterosexual or why they're um, participating in the whole enterprise. Um, and I think uh, above all, this book is about pursuing, actively pursuing and consciously pursuing your desire and figuring out why you desire what you desire. Um, and so I thought this chapter really did that. And also I feel like you can understand what's going on without knowing the, the plot of the book. So here we go. <laughs> Throughout the years, I've engaged in tons of identity pessimism. I've pointed out that I'm a New Yorker, not an embarrassing American, or I'm Jewish, so my family never enslaved anybody. I've said similar things to distance myself from my middle class intellectual roots, my marital status, and of course, my heterosexuality. Sure, I like to fuck men, but I get with women here and there. I'm not monogamous. I like to dominate my male partners from time to time. These qualifiers, while tempting, washes one's hands of any duty or accountability. They mute the rallying cries of revolution. To be permanently, preemptively disappointed in heterosexuality is to refuse the possibility of changing straight culture for the better, Asa Saracen wrote, the person who wrote that heteropessimism piece. If I really was committed to loving and fucking men, I would have to stop feeling sheepish, sheepish and inert. That meant taking a little bit of ownership, acknowledging a tiny stake in something larger, a responsibility for making it better. I didn't fully understand what this commitment could look like until one fall weekend in October 2020, when I started reading Jane Ward's book, The Tragedy of Heterosexuality. It turns the typical narrative of queer suffering on its head, calling for renewed investigation into the assumption that heterosexuality is easier than being queer. The sole focus on the trauma of queerness, she writes, quote, masks the gendered suffering produced by straight culture 
as well as queer sensations of freedom that result from having escaped not homophobia, but heterosexual misery. The book came out in the midst of the pandemic, at the tail end of the supremely stressful 2020 election, and during another moment when I was very turned off by most men. Am I straight? Do I ever want to have sex with another dude, another person again? I wrote to my journal in melodramatic frustration. Right now I feel scared, pearl clutchy, like no guy can strike the balance of sexy but not aggressive, tender but not crushingly boring. I want something but I have absolutely no idea what. How can I know that something is missing but not have the imagination to fill that space with my desire? And then the classic complaint. I'm not queer, but not asexual, but I also profoundly distrust men right now. Amid all this, a press copy of Jane Ward's book arrived. I eyed it nervously. I was already in a deep shame spiral about how I could never fully access the part of me who might be queer, that my heterosexuality was so indoctrinated that even my vagina's arousal mechanisms had learned it. Did I really have to read a book that would worsen my mood? At first, yes, the book made me feel like hetero garbage. Chapter after chapter outlined in harrowing detail how broken and bleak straight culture is, how much pain it's caused, and yet how little it's challenged by its participants. There's a chapter full of quotes from queer interviewees that are essentially different version of Layla's God, I would hate to be straight text. Layla was a woman I had a crush on who, who texted me, God, I would hate to be straight. <laughs> <laughs> but then I got to the last chapter where Ward describes the concept of deep heterosexuality. Deep heterosexuality proclaims, if straight women and men are actually attracted to each other, that is excellent. Now let's expand the notion of heterosexuality, of heterosexual attraction to include such a powerful longing for the full humanity of women and for the sexual vulnerability of men that anything less becomes suspect as authentic heterosexual desire. Ward says the solution isn't to accept the tragedy nor to defect to queerness. Echoing Carmen Maria Machado and other queer theorists, she warned that idealizing queer relationships is counterproductive. Ward also doubts the proposed strategy of queering straight relationships with things like pegging, BDSM, or polyamory. Honestly, I was relieved. I didn't think I could accept anyone telling me what kind of sex act would liberate me, especially if the goal was political purity. The solution, Ward writes, is actually to become more straight, owning that identity and resolving to enact the best version of it. If heterosexuality weren't considered the default, Ward asks, how might straight women and men articulate what propels them towards each other, despite all the difficulty? I'm going to just skip over a couple paragraphs. Do, do, do. I arranged a phone date with Ward, nervous she would pity my listless complaints about straightness. But she didn't, at least not to my face. Instead, she told me it was refreshing for hetero women to say they were emphatically in it for the dick. If women love men with <laughs> love sex with men, great, Ward said. You're working from a place of desire. Saracen describes a similar feeling after hearing the writer Larissa Pham on Heron Walker's podcast, Why Do I Like Men? Pham does cite reasons why she finds men desirable, such as big arms, penis, and the way men smell, most men. <laughs> For all their obviousness, these observations are quite rarely voiced. Hearing them spoken so plainly exposes how heteropessimism has worked to silence articulation of, of women desire, women's desire. Karen Walker, a trans woman who used to identify as a gay man, initially had a different question than her podcast title. It was the same question the radical lesbians asked and the same question I'd been asking myself. How can I stop liking men? No matter how many times a man ghosted me, disposed of me, casually crossed my boundaries, or treated me however he wanted, I would still come back for more, she wrote in W Magazine. It confused me how I could change something as seemingly fixed as my gender if for no other reason than the fact that it caused me pain, yet there I was, powerless to change my desire no matter how painful I found its consequences. She decided that asking why she desired men was perhaps a more productive line of inquiry. I similarly reasoned realized that I had spent a huge amount of time figuring out why I wasn't a lesbian, but not all that much time thinking about Walker's titular question, why I loved and lusted after men in particular. So I made my own list, which included rather specific items like narrow, smaller bodies with dicks, come, looking at it, tasting it, watching it spurt out. It's <laughs> <is> embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Spooning a cute, muscular, hairy butt. <laughs> the aching desire an erection exposes. 
Once I saw it all written down, it occurred to me that my deep heterosexuality had already been in process for a long time. Uh, and I'm going to skip a couple things. Let's see. Okay. The romantic and emotional aspects of my attraction with men were harder to explain, but they weren't any less profound. At first, I thought I might be hetero in the traditional sense, attracted to difference and unknowability. But Ward challenges this idea, too, explaining that for some radical queers, identification fosters eroticism. It has for me, too. My love for a man has at times grown out of similarity, a movie that made us both cry, an inside joke we both find hilarious, the loss of a parent breeding deep mutual empathy. My bond with Moore, a character from a previous chapter, wasn't just physical. It also involved the act of overthinking, a distinctly Jewish quality we shared. <laughs> Finally, after turning it over and over in my mind, I sort of understood what my mother meant by her basic love for men. I decided that perhaps the answer to why I loved the men I loved was too intrinsic, too elemental to break down. And that ultimately, I didn't owe anyone an ex explanation. Another lesson I've gleaned from queer friends who refuse to back up the authenticity of their sexual identity with data points. Once a desire has been consciously determined, the reasons start to seem less important. As Walker concluded after all her interrogation, who cares? I like men and that's that. Still, it was a treat to slow down and recall these sweet moments of my heterosexual life, hard earned yet primordial, outside the context of rubbing one out or regaling a friend with a sex story. For the time being, the practice of loving men didn't seem like surrender. It wasn't embarrassing or doomed, inherently tragic or toxic. I had an urge to go back to the day I received Layla's text to reply that she didn't have to feel sorry for me because I'd learned the same thing about myself as she did the day she abandoned Dick. The same thing as bisexual women do when they refuse to repress a part of themselves, as anybody does when they affirmatively express what they want. The tragedy isn't heterosexuality, I wanted to tell her, but giving up on one's desires or never uncovering them at all. That's it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I love this book. Congrats. Thanks, you made girl. it. We're here. Yeah. Um, I, reading this book, I felt, and um, not just because we're, we're, we're very good friends, um, that you were meant to write this book in so many ways. Um, and at what point did you kind of realize in the last couple of years that this was the topic you wanted to write and this was the book that you wanted to write? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I consider myself a journalist. I've written a lot of different topics. I've done reporting that does, has nothing to do with my life. But ultimately, I kept coming back to gender and sexuality over and over again. And um, especially like in around 2017, when my life was a total mess and also Me Too was happening and there was this renewed conversation about, um, about sex and pleasure. And, um, and meanwhile, I was getting very burnt out by my job because it was like the Trump years and it was insane. And so I took a buyout from Splinter, RIP and um, did some like eat, pray, love, soul searching basically and realized at that point that I had a lot to say about this topic. Although I have to say the proposal for this book looks kind of nothing like the book because then things just kept happening and um, doing the book actually made it kind of much more complicated than what I would laid out. But yeah, I would peg it to, to 2018. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think to that point, you know, the book is this like really seamless, combination of memoir, your kind of historical work, reporting, um, what was the process of kind of piecing that together? Because it comes out very smoothly, but I know, you know, there's moments that you're like reading about current day you, and then you go to your mother, and then you go back to like the 1800s, and I yeah. found that such a remarkable but really challenging tactic. Um, so what was your process like doing that? Well, the reason that I had so much history in the book is because my journey is genuinely connected to reading about all this stuff at the same time things were happening to me. Like I was up in the library reading about Emma Goldman just as I was grappling with non-monogamy and I was genuinely reading about Dana Densmore and the celibates just as I was taking a break from sex and it was actually really an intellectual journey coupled with an emotional journey. So it felt, and I felt very connected to that history and my mother, Ellen Willis, a pro-sex feminist from the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, um, 
her legacy was all over this topic and it was unavoidable and I had been grappling with, she died in 2006 and I had been grappling with her work ever since but this was sort of the deepest, most visceral way that I was grappling with it because at, finally I was sort of her age when she was writing like in her in my 30s and going through some of the same things that she was going through and so I really felt like for the first time we were dialoguing rather than like me as a 22 year old reading stuff from my mom you know so I um, the process was insanely hard like doing all of that I'm not sure I totally succeeded but um, weaving all of that together was was really hard and I mean my editor Maya Z who's here really helped me I also got some help from Carrie Fry who's another amazing editor I had people sort of like guiding that process but it was um, not easy and I think actually it was easier because my mom was also both my mom and a historical figure so she provided a lot of the connective tissue especially when I was talking about second wave feminists um, yeah, that I, so, you know, and you talk about this in your acknowledgments that, you know, her work is really in a lot of ways the a backbone of the book, and, um, you know, it's really interesting. I don't think many people are in the situation where they have to report out, you know, a close relationship, right? I mean, I know that's like you were saying, that's a style of memoir, but yeah. having to report out so deeply her words, um, how much, you know, obviously you learned a lot through the process, but... Talk a little bit about, you know, going back and like talking to her ex-boyfriends and, you know, people that knew her then and kind of what that was like, both kind of technically, but also emotionally what that experience was like and kind of reflecting on that because it is such a remarkable piece of the book is how deep you go into her archive and how much you pull and then how that really comes together. But I imagine there was, there were some challenging moments doing that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because her Two, the two ex-boyfriends that I spoke to for this book, I'd actually known kind of all my life. She was the type of person to, to keep exes in the mix, you know, like as friends. Um, and I learned a lot of new stuff while, you know, technically interviewing them for this. But I knew both of these men, and they were very different. One is sort of like chip on the shoulder, like New York leftist, and another one's this like gentle, like got Jesus-y looking guy from Colorado so they, they had very different <laughs> vibes but they were very open with me they knew me since I was a little kid and it was actually a wonderful experience what what really was amazing and fascinating was talking to my dad's ex-wife Jane who's actually my brother Michael who's here um his his mother and she was very generous with her story we don't know each other very well and she it told me some very, you know, painful things about a dad that I didn't even recognize. And so I also did reporting on my dad's life, my dad's early life, which, I mean, both my parents grew up, um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, respectively. So this is a long-ass time ago. And so the socialization was totally different, and they both kind of had to reinvent themselves. And some of those early versions of them I truly didn't recognize, but it was... Pretty fascinating. I mean, I, I I think of that two and a half hour conversation with Jane as one of the turning points of the book of sort of yeah. like, it's not just about my mom, it's also about this man in my life and how he responded to romantic relationships and mm -hmm. all the mistakes he made and things like that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and um, I imagine part of that was also, you know, your own grief and, and kind of navigating the grief, but, you know, your father passed kind of towards the end of the process. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that really, even as reading it, that really was so powerful to me that, like, you had kind of done all this archival work and you had this, like, much more complete story of him as you kind of are putting this book out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he did, he passed away like right when I put this book to bed, when I had done all the revisions, when I had just come back from a residency in Wyoming. And so I didn't really change the book like based on my grief, but he was sick for many years. So I think I was grieving him that whole time. And it was kind of, I tried to interview him for this book, but I mean, it's not like he wasn't totally, I mean, he was lucid, but he just didn't remember. It was a very unreliable narrative narrator. But what he did do is give me permission to tell my story however I wanted. And so that for that, I was grateful. He was not the type of person to be, you know, private and like squeamish about that kind of stuff. He gave me permission to do it whatever I wanted to do. Um, yeah, that 
um, makes me think about another question. I'm going to skip around here. But <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I was thinking a lot about reading this, and I talked to one of our mutual friends, Neela, about this. You write a lot about vulnerability and this question of kind of um, who has access to vulnerability, who's kind of allowed to be the most vulnerable. And I couldn't help but wonder while I was reading the book. <laughs> I was reading it, and I said, Neela says to me, she's like, God, it could have been so different for us if our parents didn't put so much pressure on us and so much shame on us about our sexuality. And you really you had were like, no, it wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> My parents did not do that. And right. And so, yeah, talk about that a little, though, because you kind of had the opposite experience. Yeah. So you put a different kind of pressure on yourself. Yeah, although it wasn't pressure... Um, applied by my parents. I mean, I don't think my parents would have ever told, had any input on my sexuality at all. And for that, I was really grateful. My mom really gave me a lot of latitude when it came to being a teenage girl who made mistakes and wore slutty outfits and did whatever I needed to do. Um, she never, I mean, sometimes I wish that she would have talked to me more about this stuff, but she really gave me the privacy that I think some teens really dream about. Um, but unfortunately, you know, my parents are my parents, but like I grew up in the world, I grew up in America and I grew up, I grew up like with all kinds of other influences. And so what I think happened was not shame around sexuality, but shame around not being this like perfect sexual feminist because, um, some of my earliest idols were like Samantha from Sex and the City and like little, little Kim and like Foxy Brown and stuff like these very seemingly invulnerable, but obviously not truly invulnerable mm -hmm. women who are just like, I'm going to get that. Like, I'm going to like, you know, eat my pussy or whatever, you know, like I, I wanted to be them, not like I wasn't, I didn't have shame around, um, I don't know. Like I didn't have shame around, uh, my desires mm -hmm. so much as like the, uh, I, di I did have shame around just, um, not living up to some sort of straw woman expectation of feminist mm -hmm. feminism because I think if you like ask individual feminists like do those standards apply they would say no and they would have a much more nuanced take but just that was the general vibe of like the cosmo like 90s mm -hmm. super slut kind of thing and I was like in seventh grade so like I didn't have very much critical thinking and it really seeped it really seeped into my soul <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think that it is, like, generational, right? Because I, I, do, I remember that when in, like, the 90s and the early 2000s where it was, like, we were supposed to brag about, you know, how non-monogamous we can be and how much we don't want to get married. And, like, yeah. then when people started to get married, they were like, I know, I'm a really bad feminist. Like, there was, like, a whole year where, like, everyone asked me to read their wedding. And I'm like, it's not going to make it more radical. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it. Just do it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, I mean, I thought that I could escape the um, the binds and, like, the expectations and the privileges, frankly, of marriage by just having this very irreverent kind of insurance-based marriage, and I couldn't. I mean, I, I marriage gives you status. Marriage gives gives you heft with old people. It gives you benefits. It gives you all kind. It gives you protection against heartbreak, like, with other people. Um, or like humiliation if they turn you down or something you can always be like well I'm a married woman like there's all kinds of there's all kinds of um, like crutches and ways in which marriage sort of bumps up your status that's kind of hard to let go even if you're like supposedly a leftist or a radical or mm -hmm. a free spirit mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean I think on that so another thing of reading the book also as your friend, you know, I, I know some, about some of these entanglements. I've heard these stories. Um, but, but the realizations in the book are, are, are quite profound. Um, you know, kind of some of the self-inquiry, some of the ways that you have kind of realized the limitations of these discourses that we feel we need to live against, heteronormativity, you know, um, the romantic industrial complex, all of those things. Um, what was that like? Like, when did you, were the realizations, like, you had them when you sat down to write, or was writing it also kind of revealing some of this to you, to yourself? Well, I think my editors could tell you that my first drafts were sort of, like, shtick me a little bit. Like, I thought I was being vulnerable, but it was, like, performed vulnerability, and it wasn't really getting to the root of the issue. Because you tell a story about yourself over and over and you have nuance to that story but it's like almost never the true full story and I'd never really sat down to write a memoir like I'd written sort of semi-memoiristic writing before 
But this was more like, okay, what's the full truth? And I'm sure I never even got to the full, full, full truth. But I had to go through several drafts to like really get at the root of the issue. And people, I mean, not only my editors, but my friends were kind of just like, is that really what I, like, can you dig a little bit deeper of like, let's talk about the times that you lied to yourself, like not just lied to your partner or whoever. Um, so that wasn't easy. I mean, I don't, <laughs> memoir writing is like, you, it, it comes out easier because it's your story and you don't have to like do painstaking research and footnotes and stuff like that, but it's not easy to actually make it true. And mm -hmm. I tried as hard as I can, but I'm sure in like 10, 10 years, I'm going to look at this and be like, that was a story I was telling myself and I need to go even one layer deeper. And that's going to be a scary moment because this is like in print. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I had a similar experience because I, you, you talked to me about, like, I'm in the book, and I read that. Yeah. I was like, oh, I feel differently than I did from two years ago or a yeah. year ago. When we well, I, about yeah, that. I talked to you, like, recently, but then I also quoted some of your G-chats yeah. from, like, 2015 or something like that. So I'm sure you we got, like, two different versions of you, you know? Just, like, I, there was a version of me in the beginning of the book, and there was a version of me at the end of the book. And now, it's only been a year or two, but then I look at the version at the end of the book and I'm like, I don't recognize you either. You know, like mm -hmm. it keeps, it keeps, it's a moving target. Yeah. Um, so the book is out in the world. People are responding to it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone's going to understand it. There's, yeah. you know, I think there has been a little bit of um, kind of sex positive feminist. I wouldn't say it's a full on backlash, but a lot of inquiry into that, right? And a little yeah. bit of pearl clutching about how um, women still don't know, you know, or women still want monogamy, but they're afraid to ask for it, and the yes. real feminism is being comfortable with that. Um, Nona, what do you have to say to your haters? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do agree that there's something very wrong about what sex positivity has turned into. I mean, that's kind of the premise of my book, that not only the patriarchy, but also a certain strain of feminism has put a lot of pressure on women. I just disagree with about the solutions. A lot of people are saying there needs to be more rules, more boundaries. I'm saying there actually needs to be more freedom. There needs to be sort of like a constellation of stories and like deep, deep nuance and ambivalence. And the more and more we do that, the more and more the stereotypes and the rigid categories that we're put, put in can start to dissipate and the more and more, like I'll take monogamy as an example. It's like, yes, monogamy might be the true desire or like let's say commitment. I think commitment is really more what people are saying when they're talking about this context. They're saying a lot of women want commitment but they're afraid to ask for it and they're suppressing their true feelings and they want their, their emotional needs are not met by hookup culture essentially. It's not like I would disagree with that but I would also say, okay, you can't just take desire at face value. There's socially con constructed reasons why you desire what you desire. That's true for commitment. That's true for monogamy. There's like a lot of internalized messaging from a very young age that people aren't respecting you unless they're monogamous or unless they want to commit to you um, or that your pride will be hurt. Well, okay, pride. Pride is a very socially constructive concept too. And that's all I'm saying. Like, I'm not even saying non-monogamy is the real feminism or monogamy is the real feminism. I'm saying, like, interrogate your desires as much as you possibly can. And sometimes they will line up with sort of the prescribed um, purported desires of women or whoever. But at least you've consciously, I mean, that's what that heterosexuality chapter was about. Like, I ended up being as heterosexual as, as you could be. But at least I was sort of this, like, conscious heterosexual person mm -hmm. rather than the, a default heterosexual person mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah um i mean i think that people take a lot of issue with that though when you're like oh it's just what i want and it's like well why is mm -hmm. that what you want right and i feel like that's what your book is really pushing us to move beyond yeah. that well yeah i mean you can feel very visceral emotions that feel kind of uh like human naturey, but like jealousy is an example of an emotion that I find to be both very visceral and painful and awful and just you feel it in your in your eyes and your gut and your stomach you know everything it's a real horrible emotion but it's also socially constructed people are telling you why you should be jealous and it's a composite emotion of like envy and insecurity and, a, and fear of abandonment and like 
you have to actually parse that out. And it's an inter the reason why people think it's so unassailable is the exact reason why you should interrogate it. You know, like a lot of people, they're not like ideologically against non-monogamy, but they're like, oh God, I can't like get into all of that jealousy. And that's cool. I mean, it's a terrible emotion, but also <laughs> it's, it's what makes it interesting to me, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. I know there's... In 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have some time for Q&As, so if people have questions, I can take some. No questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you talked about this a little at the beginning, but what do you think about the whole, like, men are trash paradigm, and do you think that's helpful, or do you, like, think it's slightly more complicated than that? Yeah, the, so hold on for the... Yeah, go ahead. Go oh, you're going to repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. The, the question is, what do you think about the men are trash paradigm, and is that helpful at all, or what, what do you think we should do about it? Um, I don't think it's helpful. I mean, I think it can be cathartic. I think <laughs> anger towards men is, like, legit. I mean, <laughs> patriarchy sucks, but ultimately, it's what I said. It's sort of like, if you say men are trash, but you also endeavor to love and partner with them, then what does that mean for your life? Like, <laughs> it's actually, it's interesting because, you know, heterosexual women are like the only, um, you know, marginalized identity or like oppressed identity who are meant to partner with and fuck and love their oppressors. Like in most other contexts, you can be like a separatist. And there were lesbian <laughs> separatists, of course, but then it's like, how do you, how do you, um, First of all, how do you like continue society? Like you <laughs> do need like men, but also there were a lot of women who um, defected to lesbianism in the '70s on prin principle rather than true desire, um, which I feel like is pyrrhic victory if you truly are heterosexual and you really do want to have um, loving relationships with men. So ultimately, it's like fine, have your men are trash moment, but then push further. You know. Anyone else? You've never been mad at me, have you? <laughs> That's my brother. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, so uh, you, in, in your last uh, response to Samita's question about, um, you know, I don't want to call it a backlash, but the response uh, sort of against hookup culture and um, interest in, uh, sort of a renewed interest in commitment and uh, how we all feel about that. Um, can you talk a little, can you connect that to uh, sort of the issues that you saw um, with uh, misogyny in committed relationships? Um, you talk a lot about the benefits of, mar of marriage. Talk, talk, talk about the new types of misogyny that folks are exposed to when they're actually in that partnership. Oh, yeah. Um, this is my partner, Dom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of, the, part of the point of this book is that even if you are dissatisfied with hookup culture and sort of the dispassionate dating scene, which like I totally understand and have felt that same pain, getting a committed relationship isn't necessarily going to solve all your problems. And you will bump up against a lot of not only misogyny, but just sort of like deeply entrenched gender roles that like you think you've been, um, you think you're above and then you turn, then you end up not being above them. I mean, um, I don't know if this is what you're referencing, Dom, but <laughs> we just had a baby. Our baby's three months old, and I just have noticed like the very different ways in which like my friends have been reacting to me versus Dom's male friends. And part of it is because he's younger than me and they don't have kids, but it's also the way men are socialized to deal with their friends who have babies versus women who are socialized to deal with their friends who have babies. And I just like can't believe that like you know there's so little support for, for like for dads in that way and it, it really and and I've also just been really taken aback by the just inherent um just like the inherently different uh what's the I, this is hard to articulate because it's happening in my life currently but just like the visceral bi biological and emotional experience of being a mother combined with all of the sort of gender norms that we've been taught and it's really hard to parse out which is which and it's very maddening and I think that happens a lot in heterosexual relationships where it's like how much of this is either biology or like different roles that have to do with your bodies like getting pregnant and stuff and how much is the, of this is socialized it's not always easy to know 
Yeah, and that one thing I was thinking also reading that and listening to that is like, you're also tired, right? Like, so it's like you're tired and then you're trying to figure out, it's like, well, but you should do this and you should do this. And I'm too tired to even figure it out. It's like, fuck it, I'll just do it. Like, I, I can't, you know? Well, there's like, a reason sleep deprivation is a literal form of torture. <laughs> but I mean, it happens, it happens when you don't have a baby, too. I mean, yeah. stuff about housework, for instance. Yeah. Um, stuff about social calendars and who's friends with whom. And, just, and actually just how friendship, um, like, manifests itself in, in like, couple relationship is so so interesting to me. But like, yeah, misogyny and gender roles totally rear their ugly head, whether you're in, like when you're, whether you're swiping on Tinder or you're in a committed relationship. Hard to escape, impossible to. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking of a question about the intersection of, or the tension between sexuality and motherhood when this question was asked. And you're three months in, but I'm wondering <laughs> if in your research at all, um, because my children are 20 and 17, and I can, you know, the, the, the way that having children impacted what I felt I was allowed to do, right? Like, what will your, what will your children think if, mm -hmm. if you are, you know, a freely sexual person? Like, even in a liberal place like Brooklyn, you know, it's, it's very, it's very confined. It's very conventional in so many ways. Like, do you feel, or did you see anything in your research about a different set of rules for mothers? Yeah, so for the live stream audience. Yeah, sorry, we didn't do that last <laughs> yeah. So basically, what are the kind of extra pressures you might feel as a parent um, and as a mother, kind of this question of like, what will your children think even in the most kind of liberal communities and progressive circles. People have judgment of kind of alternative relationships and sexual styles in kind for of mothers traditionally. In I'm not even going to say parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for mothers. For mothers in particular. Yeah. Um, well, I definitely didn't think about this question as a mother myself. I got pregnant with my daughter pretty much also right after I was, um, handed in the book. My father died and my, my daughter uh, was conceived. Um, but I mean, a lot of this book is about my mother and, um, I remember people being weird about the fact that my parents weren't married for a very, very long time. Um, and this was like nineties park slope, which like wasn't the park slope of today. It was like, not as, um, I don't know. It was just like kind of like normal middle class, like not, not necessarily like progressive. Um, and the, and I think it was weird it was still weird for that to be the case and um people had kind of judgy and interesting reactions and i think um they weren't non-monogamous as far as i know but i think it would have been the same kind of vibe as just sort of like your family is like a little also they were like older mm -hmm. and so your family is a little little weird little different and like not as uh i mean kids are so um, they like don't mince words and they tell you how, you how they feel so like they would say stuff like that's weird like your parents are old they have gray hair like um, and I feel like it would kind of be the same thing like if you were in like polyamorous um, situation or if you like had um, you know if you had like a queer relationship or something like that like kids would be kind of cruel um, but in terms of yeah I didn't think about how it it's gonna affect my daughter um, in like progressive. I think people, people do, okay, here's what I'll say. In progressive communities, I think even now, people um, really do like a hermetically sealed thing when they become very committed to somebody, whether that means that they've been married or they have a kid. It's like all of a sudden your household is like very much your business and that's like kind of what got me into trouble that I felt like I couldn't talk about my relationship because it was, we, we had been together for so many years and we were so committed that everybody kind of assumed we were settled and I was having doubts and I was sort of like wanting to know what people thought but I felt a little bit like, oh, that's TMI, like you're not supposed to talk about that. And I felt that same way about like talking about my open relationship. So I imagine that as a mother, it might even get more intense because there's more at stake.
But I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been three months. So I don't yeah, know. and and, I, and just to clarify, I didn't mean kids judging. I meant other mothers judging. Yeah, so. no, yeah. I know. <laughs> I know, but I was just thinking about. I, I guess my perspective is, yeah, yeah, the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's an issue too. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, I mean, so the yeah, question yeah. is, um, how, as you were parsing through your sexuality, um, sorry, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> she's saying, she's saying, um, how how did you affirmatively yes, yeah. uh, determine that you were actually heterosexual yeah. or sexual? What was that process like? Yeah. Well, that's an example of something that was kind of an intellectual um, rather than just an emotional journey. Like, I kind of acknowledged that I'd been with, like, a handful of women, and a lot of it was a little, it was, like, a little performative. Like, it was um, in service of a narrative that I was, like, a down-for-whatever kind of <laughs> woman. And I decided to sort of, like, um, not be that way and genuinely, like, try to have, like, a real, a real encounter. Like, not, I wouldn't say, like, relationship, like, committed relationship, like, a real relationship with like a woman or somebody of a different gender or like try like um I I like watched a lot of like different types of porn and then I also read a lot of stuff about like the radical lesbians of the 70s who were very um affirmative and like specific about why they were lesbians like I think that some of the modern um, ways in which we think about queerness is like born this way like I can't I can't help it especially when it comes to like white men that's like a very like big rallying cry born this way but the radical lesbians especially like radical lesbians of color from the 70s and 80s they were very much like no this is like an affirmative conscious desire of mine and here are the reasons why like no straight people just ever do that like they never say like here are the reasons why I'm straight and it's kind of hard to do like I was reading the chapter and saying like I don't really know why I love men that's like way harder and also, like, I don't totally know why I'm attracted to cis men when, like, some people of other genders have those same characteristics that I was describing. So, like, on some level you may not know, but I think it's it's the, the pausing and thinking about it that, like, most hetero people don't even do. But in my case, it was also reading a bunch of stuff, but that's just who I am and what I like to do. <laughs> yeah. Nona. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. So, we're doing a signing. We're doing a signing. Yes. Yes, I will. I will make an announcement. May I borrow the yes, microphone, please? please. I, I don't want to get you entangled in there. No. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi everyone again, thank you so much. Um, and thank you Nona and Samita for the wonderful conversation. Um, as a reminder, yeah. Um, as a reminder, Nona will be signing at our back desk. Uh, I do just ask to, uh, for you all to wait to approach the desk until she's gotten settled back, settled back there. Um, we will also be providing um, one of our Annas to, go, to be going down the line with a post-it uh, post note to write your name on for personalizations. You can purchase additional copies of Bad Sex at the front desk where you checked in. Um, for those of you who are still with us on YouTube, you can find the link to purchase books in the description. Um, that is all from me. Thank you again, everybody, for coming out here tonight. Please join me in giving Noah and Samita a final round of applause. Yay!